questions. We're going to turn now to portfolio questions on government, business and constitutional relations. And the first question is from James Kelly. In fact, sorry, I just remind members that uh, questions one and seven are grouped together. So question one, James Kelly. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what, what funding has been made available to Glasgow City Council in preparations for a no-deal Brexit. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Presiding Officer, I'm aware that Glasgow City Council and other local authorities have expressed concerns about possible costs of the UK leaving the EU. Uh, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities has written to the Scottish Government seeking an additional 1.6 million funding for councils to help meet Brexit-related costs, and we will respond in due course after the European election period. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but I would point out to him that uh, with interest in the Conservative Party, around Boris Johnson's candidature for leader and therefore Prime Minister ready to be successful. The prospect of a no-deal Brexit that none of us uh, want uh, is increasing. And therefore it's unacceptable that the £19 million made available to the Scottish Government, none has been available to Scotland's largest city, Glasgow, uh, to, to deal with a potential no-deal Brexit. So can I urge and ask the Cabinet Secretary to review that funding allocation and fairly allocate money to Glasgow in order that Glasgow's lar and Scotland's largest city can prepare for the potential of a no-deal Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I entirely agree that the uh, issue of funding for no-deal preparation is a live one. That's why I've indicated to Mr Kelly, as I did in my first answer, that a proposal has been made by COSLA <coughs> and we will respond to that uh, uh, proposal. I also agree with him that the prospect of a no-deal Brexit is continuing to grow, and it is quite obvious that there are individuals within the UK Cabinet who wish a no-deal Brexit, and obviously that will also be something, as Mr Kelly has indicated, which will be in the minds of uh, those candidates who are bidding to be the leader of the Tory party. Uh, we are aware of all that. We will continue to work closely with all stakeholders across Scotland, first of all to resist a no-deal Brexit, to resist Brexit, but also to make sure we have the maximum preparedness that we cannot be prepared for everything. And question seven, Joanne Lamond. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Glasgow City Council regarding resilience planning in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government believes that the best future for Scotland is the one that 62% of Scottish voters chose to remain in the European Union. However, as a responsible government, we're preparing for all EU exit possibilities. As part of that work, we continue to work closely with our partners in local government, including COSLA and individual councils such as Glasgow, to help them prepare for the potential impact of EU exit, including the possible impacts of a no deal. I'm sure the member will be interested to know that I have just come from a meeting with the Scottish Cities Alliance, uh, which includes Glasgow City Council, at which we have discussed a range of issues, including no deal Brexit. John Lamont. 2016, Glasgow City Council, the Glasgow Economic Leadership Board and the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce produced a joint report outlining action to deal with Brexit and emphasising joint working between Glasgow City Council and the Scottish Government. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how that joint work has been progressed and can he explain why, despite getting £92 million extra to deal specifically with Brexit, none of that money, none has gone to Glasgow and other local authorities, which are in the front line of dealing with the economic consequences of Brexit, consequences that will come very shortly and ought to be addressed immediately, rather at some point in the future, as the Cabinet Secretary has already suggested. Cabinet Secretary. I've just indicated to Mr Kelly, and I'm happy to do so again, that we are in discussion with COSLA and with... I've just indicated, I don't know if the record will show it, but uh, Jan Lawman keeps shouting during this. Uh, if she would expend her energy in attacking the Tories over Brexit with as much yeah, energy yeah. as she shows attacking the government, perhaps we would make more progress. The reality of the situation is we are in discussion with COSLA and with the Scottish Cities Alliance. I've just had a very positive uh, and I think constructive meeting with the Scottish Cities Alliance, including Glasgow City Council. We've looked at a range of issues and we've agreed to continue to work together. That should be a matter which would have the support of the Labour benches, not the shrill continued, and I draw attention again to the record, the shrill continued shouting from Joanne Lamont. Let's try and work together to defeat Brexit rather than, and there it goes again, rather than have that type of approach. 
The Cabinet Secretary must be in a very sensitive mood this morning. I don't think the member is exactly shouting. However, if all members, if all members from all parties would take a leaf out of the Cabinet Secretary's book and keep their comments to themselves, that would be good. Joan McAlpine. Thank you. Could the Scottish Government confirm whether or not the consequentials received due to UK Government Brexit spending will come anywhere close to meeting the protected economic and social cost of Scotland from being taken out of the EU against our will and that the best future for Scotland is one in Europe? Well, the point is a, a key one. The vast amounts of money, time and resource that have been spent on No Deal Brexit will not be compensated for by any of the resources that we've had. But we have tried to have a broad front against Brexit to work closely with uh, organisations and individuals, as we have done with COSLA, as we are doing with the cities, as we've done with a range of stakeholders. And this is work that unifies us. And voices, shouting or not, that actually contradict that are unhelpful voices and are not achieving the best for either Glasgow or Scotland. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will integrate the principle of non-regression into provisions on keeping pace with EU laws to ensure that no new measures inadvertently lead to a, lower, a lowering of consumer and, and, and environmental standards. I thank the member for his constructive question. As I outlined in my letter to the presiding officer of the 5th of April, the Scottish Government is determined to respect the choices the Scottish Parliament made when passing the Scottish Continuity Bill to the maximum extent possible. <coughs> we therefore plan new legislation to allow devolved law to keep pace with developments in EU law. I also confirm that the Scottish Government is, and I quote, committed to no regression in standards or protections should EU exit take place, and the replacement of regulatory powers lost in consequence of EU exit will be essential to ensure that. I also made specific commitments on environmental principles and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I'm grateful to colleagues across the Chamber for the constructive discussions all the parties have had on these matters, and will take the issue forward in that way. Mark Griffin. I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, the Government support the new legal duty on Scottish Ministers to have regard to the four EU environmental principles and the development of policies and legislation. And, but I'm not sure if I, I picked up correctly, but having regard to the environmental principles is not a, a substitute for protecting us from backward changes in environmental legislation and practices, even if these happen inadvertently. Does the, the Cabinet Secretary agree um, with the principle of non-regression? And if so, will he build that into a statutory duty? But, yes, I do. Uh, I mean, that's why I said in my letter to the presiding officer, which the parties have seen, that I, and I quote, am committed to no regression in standards or protections. And that applies to environment as to other areas. Uh, the issue of the keeping pace power, which includes no regression, uh, was a, a, a significant one during the passage of the continuity bill. Um, I have to say that the parliament decided to narrow that from the original proposal. I'm very happy to see that expanded again. And of course, I believe in no regression on, on all the principles, uh, including the environmental principles. And uh, we will do our very best to make sure that it is achieved. I hope we will have the support of the Labour benches when that legislation comes to the Parliament. Because, to be fair, we had that support with the continuity bill. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The keeping pace power is, of course, contained in the continuity bill. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary announced, I think, during the recess that there was not going to be an opportunity to reconsider the continuity bill after the Supreme Court judgment's uh, verdict uh, on that bill, holding most of it to be unlawful. When, therefore, does the Cabinet Secretary think that this Parliament is going to be given the chance to repeal that illegal legislation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I dispute the uh, characterization of the Supreme Court's judgment, I have to say. Uh, it misses out a, a very significant issue, which is the fact that the UK government changed the law uh, whilst Again, presiding officer, I'm trying to have a rational uh, input to this without people trying to interrupt. The situation is that the UK government changed the law when we put the uh, bill into, uh, into the parliament after we passed the bill in this chamber. So if people think that that is a good idea, then they certainly have a great deal to learn about democracy. Um, we will take forward the keeping pace power. We will do so in a way that the Parliament can legislate on. We had the support of this chamber on that, and by and large, and I hope we will have that again. And we will tidy up other matters uh, as we see fit. Question number three, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact that Brexit could have on immigration to Scotland. Minister Ben McPherson. 
Thank you, President Officer. I have met twice with the UK Immigration Minister, Caroline Noakes, to discuss the profoundly positive impact migration has on Scotland's economy and society. And there have been several other meetings between Scottish Government ministers and UK ministers emphasising this, including between the First Minister and the Prime Minister. Migration is crucial to Scotland's future prosperity and any reduction would damage our labour market, economic growth, demographic profile and local communities. The independent report from the Expert Advisory Group on Migration and Population published in February this year stated that the UK Government's immigration proposals could lead to a 30 to 50 per cent reduction in that net migration to Scotland over the next two decades, uh, which would lead to a decline in our working age population of up to 5 per cent. Therefore, in all relevant meetings and correspondence, the Scottish Government has emphasised and will keep emphasising the deep concerns that there are across Scotland about the proposals in the UK Government's White Paper on Immigration after Brexit. Stuart Stevenson. Um, it's not often I join with the CBI in criticising the plans uh, for the immigration system in Scotland, but I do so and ask if, in particular, with uh, people coming to Scotland to work, to contribute economically, in my constituency in fishing, elsewhere in farming, but throughout our economy, is it not important that we have devolved powers so that we can fine tune immigration to meet our particular specific needs? Minister. Yes, as Stuart Stevenson and as the CBI and other business organisations have emphasised, the UK government's proposals in their immigration white paper would be catastrophic for Scotland. They would send our working age population into decline and would have a significantly negative effect on many sectors, including those that Stuart Stevenson mentioned, but also social care, tourism, construction, financial services and several others. In opposing many of the proposals in the UK government's white paper on immigration and considering Scotland's distinct demographic challenges, there is growing support for the Scottish Parliament to obtain additional powers within a UK framework in order to tailor migration policy to meet Scotland's needs, remain attractive to migrants and deliver new solutions. Question number four, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what role it considers the Scottish Parliament should have in developing and approving international treaties that impact on devolved matters. Cabinet Secretary Michael Murphy. Sorry, officer, this is a crucial issue. Scotland's devolved in institutions have an important role to play in the negotiation and ratification of international treaties. The Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament should be recognised as equals with the UK Government and Parliament in their respective areas of competence, with a presumption of interest and full, formal and early involvement in the process of making international agreements. Formal mechanisms must be established to ensure this Parliament can carry out its role in scrutinising the mandate, negotiation and implementation of treaties. The consent of the, of the, consent of the Scottish Parliament should be secured before international agreements that impact and devolve matters are ratified. Patrick Harvey. When people cast their votes to elect uh, this Parliament and choose the people they send here, they have a right to know that the people sitting in this chamber will be able to make decisions on all devolved matters and will be able to hold the Scottish Government to account for its actions on devolved matters as well. Is it not clear, therefore, that three things are required in respect to treaties, such as trade deals, uh, which impact on devolved areas? That the negotiating mandate may not proceed without the consent of this Parliament, explicit in a resolution? That a final text may not be adopted without the similar consent in respect to devolved matters in a resolution of this Parliament? And thirdly, equally importantly, that this Parliament will have the ability legally to change its mind and withdraw consent if the political balance in the Parliament changes. Otherwise, we will have a Parliament and a government which is fettered by its predecessors in respect of matters that the people of Scotland have the right to cast their votes on to change policy. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, I don't find anything difficult or objectionable in, in, those, um, in those definitions. Indeed, I, I agree with them. Uh, there is a problem in the UK government, well, there are many problems in the UK government, but there is a problem in the UK government in how particularly it looks at the issue of trade. Uh, uh, and trade has changed very greatly in the years uh, since the UK joined the EU. The lesson that the UK government has attempted to draw, for example, from the CETA treaty, is that you should keep the devolved administrations as far away as possible, given the experience of the CETA treaty and its final ratification. The lesson that should take is the opposite lesson 
that in actual fact ensuring that the Canadian provinces were in the room when the CETA treaty was negotiated and were able to negotiate on the areas of competence that they had was absolutely crucial to the successful conclusion of that process. So in actual fact, the United Kingdom government in trying to exclude the devolved administration from these matters is, is cutting off its nose to spite its face. It will make it harder for it to take these issues forward. But that is the practical issue. The political and democratic and constitutional issues are as Mr. Harvey has outlined. I made that point in my answer. And it is essential that, that is recognized by the UK government. Presently, they appear to wish to ignore that. And that will be and is utterly unacceptable. Now, question five and question eight are grouped together. I'm going to try and squeeze them both in. Question five, Alison Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it considers citizens' assemblies, what role, what scope it considers citizens' assemblies could have in the governance of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. As the First Minister said out in her statement to Parliament on the 24th of April, the EU exit experience has shown the weakness in the current devolution settlement and the UK's constitutional arrangements more widely. We must consider the best way forward for Scotland in the light of that experience. In doing so, we want to avoid the division created over EU exit. That's why the First Minister announced that we would establish a citizens' assembly to consider the best way forward for Scotland. I will update Parliament on further developments shortly. Last week, Presiding Officer, I went to Ireland, where I met with the Chair and Secretary of the Constitutional Convention and members of the Secretariat of the Citizens' Assembly, amongst others. I was very impressed with what I learned. I've invited both secretaries of the Irish models to Scotland in the next few weeks to inform our planning. I hope the parties across the chamber will welcome and be involved in the initiative and these discussions in particular. And I'll be writing to party leaders to invite them to do so this afternoon. Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you. A citizen's assembly, of course, should represent the demographics of the whole population in a way that as yet this parliament has failed to do. Um, so will the cabinet secretary be considering you know, ensuring a diversity of assembly that can properly consider all perspectives and help deliver a real meaningful outcome. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the member raises a very important issue. The establishment of a citizens' assembly should endeavour to establish a body um, for a particular purpose, and that, that purpose mustn't be too wide, but it must be representative of society. And there are a number of ways in which that can be done. And it was an issue in both the Constitutional Convention in Ireland and in the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland. How do you do so? It's a very hard thing to do uh, because you are trying to balance demography, you're trying to uh, balance geography, you're trying to balance uh, sectoral interests and a variety of, uh, of minorities and majorities. And it will require a lot of work by us. And I hope it will be a task that the, uh, all the parties will find themselves involved in to do that. But I am determined that the Citizens' Assembly, which we will establish, and I hope will be, be meeting by the autumn of this year, I am determined that it should represent in that way, and there are a number of ways to do so, and I'll be happy to discuss with other parties, with Alison Johnson and others, about how we are trying to do that, and to seek the input of other parties in their views about how we should do that. Question eight, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the costs will be of establishing a Citizens' Assembly. Cabinet Secretary. As I've tried to indicate, that will depend upon the design of the Assembly, which I wish to discuss with party representatives and to get their views. Uh, we certainly have learned from the Irish experience it should be an open and transparent process. All details, including costs, will be published in full as the process goes forward. Adam Tompkins. Uh, given that this is already per head of population, the most expensive parliament in the United Kingdom, more expensive per head of population than the House of Commons, the House of Lords, or the Welsh Assembly. According to the, according to the recently published report of the Institute for Government, looking at devolution uh, after 20 years, what is the justification for any additional expenditure, given that this parliament is already open, transparent, and representative of the people of Scotland? Interestingly, one of the things we learned in Ireland, that there was at the start of, of the process, both at the Constitutional Convention and the Citizens' Assembly, that view expressed by a number of individuals. They said, we've got a parliament, why do we need a Citizens' Assembly or a Constitutional Convention? What happened as the process went through is that people realized the difference between them. For example, the Citizens' Assembly, and considering the uh, Amendment 8 in the Constitution, the matter of, of abortion, uh, had five separate meetings in which they heard from experts, but they also heard from advocacy groups, but it was entirely factually based. Uh, and that was a very important development, because what happened is that we, they did away with the, the noise 
uh, and the confusions around politics. And they looked at the facts of the matter and they tried to reconcile the views that existed across society. Now, what I, I stand uh, in, in no way critical of this parliament or any parliament, but it's not exactly a place that specializes in reconciling diverse views. There is a way by listening to people and be, uh, creating the circumstances in which there can be a genuine dialogue that you can make progress. That is what we wish to do. And the Brexit process indicates to us why it should happen. Because what we have actually seen in the Brexit process is real division created by the inability to consider all views and to do it on a factual basis. I would urge Mr. Tompkins to come along to meet the people involved, to have these conversations, and let's see if we can jointly author something that will take our nation forward. Thank you very much. And that concludes uh, government business and constitutional relations questions. We're going to move on shortly to culture, tourism and external affairs. Just take a few moments for ministers to change seats. We now move on to culture, tourism and external affairs. And question number one is Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports communities in celebrating their heritage. Fiona Hislop. Uh, I recognise the hard work carried out by local communities to protect the historic environment and to secure the future of their local heritage. Scottish Government's support for heritage is channeled through our various sponsored bodies who work in the area of heritage with communities. The Scottish Government has maintained Historic Environment Scotland's external grants funding at £14.5 million per year, which is channeled into local heritage projects. For example, Bearsden Baptist Church in the members' constituency who are working to create interpretation and learning spaces in their gardens on the site of a Roman fort on the Antonine Wall World Heritage Site. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Um, Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill, who lived in Bishop Briggs in my constituency, is known as the father of Scottish democracy. His memory is kept alive by a local group called the Friends of Thomas Muir. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe more could be done by Visit Scotland or perhaps the Scottish Government to promote figures of such historical importance? Fiona Hislop. Uh, Visit Scotland, which uh, receives around £48 million in grant and aid, promotes different places, events, activities and indeed uh, historical figures. I've also, uh, in my previous answer, referred to Historic Environment Scotland. And indeed the friends of Thomas Muir may be interested to know that Historic Environment Scotland have a commemorative plaque scheme uh, introduced in recent years, celebrating significant people by erecting plaques on the buildings where they lived or worked. And certainly uh, Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill uh, is, is certainly deserving of that and uh, wider promotion. People are interested, yes, in places, but also in the people who have shaped our society. And Thomas Muir in his pursuit of democracy uh, certainly has done that. Supplementary, Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that a hugely important part of Glasgow's heritage is its international contribution to live music and to the live music business and that aspect of the nighttime economy. Uh, given the serial disasters that have hit Socky Hall Street in Glasgow over the course of the last uh, year, what support is the Scottish Government giving to Glasgow to support its live music heritage? Fiona Hislop. Uh, well, clearly Creative Scotland is the responsible sponsor body in promoting uh, uh, contemporary uh, art projects, particularly in, in relation to a number of areas. But in relation to, to music, I do believe that as a UNESCO city of music, Glasgow itself uh, has to promote uh, music and to look after the venues that, that exist there. Uh, but in terms of grants or applications, uh, in terms of what can be done to different sites, uh, there's a number of different things that can be done. Uh, Creative Scotland in particular have been promoting uh, contemporary music, uh, more in the terms of artists rather than say venues. Uh, but if there are any specific projects that are coming forward uh, from Glasgow City Council or indeed any promoters, uh, then we will certainly provide advice and support as to where they can, can go to ensure that any projects uh, can, can be taken forward. Uh, it is really important that we recognise the importance of our, our uh, music, not just for artists, but also to audiences. Uh, but I've yet to see any proposals coming forward. Question number two, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with representatives of the Edinburgh International Festival. 
Fiona Hesler. Uh, Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of the Edinburgh International Festival and the last time they met was earlier this month on the 3rd of May. On the 30th of May, I am meeting with Fergus Linehan, Festival Director, and Frank Higgy, the Edinburgh International Festival's new Executive Director after the departure of Joanna Baker. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Many cultural organisations, including the Fringe and International Festivals, are likely to be impacted by the uncertainty of Brexit. Can the Minister provide an update as to how much money has been allocated through its International Creative Ambition Programme, announced as part of the Scottish Government's 2018-19 programme last September and due to be in place by May of this year? Fiona Hisler. Uh, not quite sure where the minister, uh, the member, got his uh, information from. Can I say the international creative ambition is more uh, wide uh, than necessarily looking at festivals? Uh, we have already extensively uh, supported the uh, festivals to remain competitive uh, by maintaining their Edinburgh Expo Fund. Uh, the member asked about the Edinburgh International Festival itself. It's receiving £190,000 of Expo funding for the five concert series celebrating uh, the achievements of our composer, uh, James McMillan. Uh, in terms of uh, additional funding he asked for, uh, the PLACE programme, which was funded as part of uh, the discussions around the City Deal, has also given additional funding this year and ongoing to the different festivals to make sure that they remain competitive. The International Creatives um, Ambition Fund will be used for other means uh, rather than necessary festivals, but it's absolutely vital that we recognise recognise the threat of Brexit to our cultural life in Scotland is one we have to recognise. We shouldn't have to compensate people for it uh, in terms of our festivals or other areas, uh, but we certainly have to stop it to make sure that we can maintain the cultural, vibrant, international aspects of all our festivals. Uh, can I have short supplementaries, please? Kezia Dugdale, then Keith Brown. Thank you, President Officer. The festivals are indeed a wonderful time of the year, but staff working in those festivals are often quite vulnerable for exploitation. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what work she's done in the last 12 months to promote the Fair Fringe Charter? Fiona Hislop. Uh, clearly, the uh, festivals are independent organisations from government, uh, but I do think it is important that we promote fair work. I had a meeting just last week with the SDC in relation to fair work in the cultural sector, and in terms of the work of the Fringe, uh, in terms of what they do, I think it's something that we can all be involved in in trying to support their charter. But it's a matter for them and their artists and also the venues they use, and I think it's important that we recognise that. But clearly, fair work um, and uh, during the festival is something that I would want to promote and as I said uh, I had a meeting on this uh, issue just last week with the SUC. Keith Brown. Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the director of the Edinburgh International Festival's comments last year that a no deal Brexit would have a disastrous and horrible impact on Edinburgh's festival and that for 2019 he was having to prepare a scale back event which in itself is a scandal. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm the very real threat that especially a Boris led no deal Brexit poses to our festivals and cultural events the length and breadth of Scotland? Fiona Hislop. Well, indeed, when those remarks were made, remember the UK was meant to have left in October and then it was left meant to have left in March. But clearly, uh, not just a no-deal Brexit, but an any-deal Brexit will cause severe difficulties. We know in terms of immigration uh, that currently non-EU artists really struggle in terms of getting access to our festivals and quite often in terms of uh, cancellations at last minute, even when we can try and appeal some of those issues. If you then apply that to all EU artists, uh, the disaster that awaits in terms of the Brexit immigration policy uh, for the UK will severely damage our festivals and that is why it has to be resisted. Question number three, Billy Coffey. To ask the Scottish Government how it sees tourism between Scotland and the EU countries developing in the future. Fiona Hislop. The EU will remain a key market for Scotland's tourism industry. Six of Scotland's top 10 markets for overseas visitors are in the European Union, accounting for 34% of overseas overnight visitors and 31% of overseas tourist expenditure in 2017. Visit Scotland is actively promoting Scotland as an open and welcoming nation in the face of an EU exit. Uh, the latest Scotland in now, is now activity for Europe. Scotland is open, uh, launched on the 29th of March, is our best performing campaign to date with record levels of engagement with over 79 million people reached with adverts. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very detailed answer? She'll be aware that the volumes of travellers from Scotland to Dublin each year travelling by air is well over a million and exceeds by far the numbers travelling to Paris or indeed any of the regional Spanish airports. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary see an, opportun an opportunity here, perhaps, to support the development of Scotland's ferry services to and from Dublin, to take advantage of a route that seems increasingly popular with Scottish as well as Irish tourists? Fiona Heslop. Well, increasingly sustainable travel uh, routes will be important to our tourism sector. Um, I'm very interested in the uh, increasing travel between uh, Scotland and Dublin, uh, something we're trying to promote particularly with our uh, Scottish uh, Innovation Investment Hub uh, based in Dublin. I understand from transport officials that there have been discussions on possible new routes with a number of operators and business consortiums over the years on a number of different European uh, ferry services. They have uh, not yet been able to develop a viable service as yet, but of course any service would need to be commercially viable. But we remain uh, open and interested in different routes uh, to maintain those contacts and promote sustainable tourism. Question number four, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the Dance School of Scotland's MTC Showcase 2019. Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government welcomes the MTC Showcase 2019 by the Dance School of Scotland at the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall from the 12th to the 15th of June. It provides the opportunity for young talent from one of Scotland's six national centres of excellence to perform to large audiences. These world-class facilities make a significant contribution to cultural life in Scotland and internationally. And the Scottish Government supports these centres uh, through the local government funding settlement to the five councils who host them. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister for that reply. Uh, Scotland School of Dance is based at Knightswood Secondary School, which is in my constituency in Glasgow, Annie's land. And the school admits pupils through audition and is completely free. Does the Minister agree, and I think she does uh, from her previous answer, that this type of specialised schooling provides the opportunity for children from any background to reach their full potential and enriches the cultural life of Scotland? Fiona Hislop. Uh, I think this is a, a fantastic opportunity to highlight the work of all of our six centres. We've got Douglas Academy, uh, who's, who specialise in music, Broughton High School Music, Dice Academy in Aberdeen Music, Plockton High School and Highland Traditional Music, Bella Houston Academy, Glasgow Sport, and of course, uh, Knightswood High School, uh, referred to by the member. Uh, these are open to young people from, from any background. They work as a pi pipeline uh, to uh, identify talent for our national performance companies going forward uh, in their careers uh, and is a, are a great asset to the cultural life of Scotland. Question number five, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will assist the tourism sector to attract workers in the event of Scotland being impacted by an end to freedom of movement following Brexit. Fiona Hislop. Uh, well, I'll continue to make the case to the UK Government that moves to limit migration will harm our tourism sector. We are also engaged with industry to address these risks. Our tourism skills investment plan and the potential tourism sector deal will focus on addressing skills gaps and promoting tourism as a career of choice for those joining in the industry at whatever stage. Skills Development Scotland are also proactively encouraging tourism as a career for the domestic population and we're also working to build attractiveness by ensuring that fair work uh, principles underpin the sector. Gillian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. According to Visit Scotland last year, the Scottish tourism sector employed 21,000 EU nationals from other countries. Given that the UK Home Office's white paper, the UK's future skills-based immigration system, has said that work visas will only be available to people with salaries over 30,000 per annum, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how that kind of system would impact tourism worker numbers? Fiona Hislop. UK Government's immigration white paper shows uh, a shocking uh, disregard to the needs of our tourism and indeed other sectors in Scotland. If there is a salary limit of £30,000 per annum on workers in the tourism sector, that could result in an 85% reduction of inflow of long-term workers uh, from European countries to Scotland. If you have a reduction in workers coming to work in our tourism and hospitality sector, you have skill shortages, that impacts on quality, that impacts on experience, and that can damage our sector. I think it's one of the areas that I appeal to the, the Chamber across all parties to get behind. We have to stop this because of the detriment effect it will have on our tourism sector and our economy will be one that is long lasting and I think uh, it's something that is very very sincere indeed and it's why we've really got to stop, stop, to stop the Brexit process itself and certainly stop this immigration white paper. Supplementary Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the Scottish Affairs Committee, we heard evidence from Stephanie Morell that said agencies such as hers struggle to get people to go to Scotland from the EU to work 
And moreover, there are now record numbers of EU nationals, 2.38 million living and working in the UK despite Brexit. Clearly, it is one of the roles of the government, Scottish Government, to make Scotland an attractive place of work and to support more Scots into the hospitality industry, particularly in remote and rural areas. We've heard of some of the ideas... Uh, could you get to the question, please, Ms Hamilton? Would the Cabinet Secretary hi highlight how she can help more people, young people, to get into hospitality in rural and re remote areas, please? Fiona Hislop. A, a lot of that work, as I said, is from the Tourism Investment Skills uh, Plan that is also working with uh, the network of colleges that we have in terms of supply um, of uh, those skills. But can I say it's not just... Uh, in terms of uh, remote areas, uh, the pool of young people that are available uh, will also be uh, subject to competition from other sectors wanting them to be enter their areas. So, as I said, all life stages. So, we're also seeing an impact to try and encourage uh, people perhaps of um, older ages to come back into the workforce by working in tourism as well. So, the accessibility of those networks, the number of apprenticeships that we have in those areas are something that we're uh, promoting very heavily uh, and also as part of, a, as I said, our, our wider skills plan and also working with the rest of the UK in terms of that promotion is something I'll be speaking to other tourism ministers about when I meet with them shortly. Question number six, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and can I note members to my register of interest related to tourism. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans they have to develop resources to support the expansion of tourism and culture. Fiona, uh, Scotland's cultural uh, life, our economy, our international reputation are influenced by the success of our tourism and culture sectors. Against a backdrop of public spending constraints, we remain committed to supporting the growth of both sectors in a sustainable and inclusive way that will benefit all of our communities. Uh, following the original Tourism 2020 strategy, Scotland's new tourism strategy is being developed, which will help the industry and the Scottish Government address our current and future challenges, including pressures on infrastructure, rising costs and EU exit and to become a world-class visitor destination. Uh, in the 2019-20 budget, we're investing £269.6 million in Scotland's culture, tourism and heritage sector. Alexander Burnett. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, in the last four years of published statistics, all 114 jobs advertised by Creative Scotland were in the central belt. So can, can the Cabinet Secretary inform me as to whether there have been any advertised in the North East more recently, given the considerable contribution of the North East to Scottish culture? Fiona Hislop. Uh, I am not the personnel manager for Creative Scotland. I think the member has made his, his point in terms of advertising. Uh, but in terms of recruitment, uh, anybody across Scotland are eligible to, uh, and indeed beyond Scotland, are eligible to apply for these posts. Uh, location of these posts uh, tend to be uh, based where the headquarters are. The headquarters of Creative Scotland um, is in Glasgow, uh, in, in Edinburgh, but they also have offices in Glasgow. Uh, in terms of if you're suggesting that there, there should be relocation of offices elsewhere uh, that is something that he can make personally to Creative Scotland but of course I expect as Minister uh, that Creative Scotland and all their staff not just uh, not just uh, the ones that are being recruited serve all of Scotland and serve them geographically and I expect that to happen in the North East as anywhere else in Scotland. Question number seven Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what support it will provide to help the Waverley paddle steamer return to sailing on the Clyde. Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Waverley is a, an iconic part of the Clyde's history and its trips uh, provide a unique experience for visitors to the area. Although we have not been approached by its operators, uh, the Scottish Government, through its agencies, would be happy to provide appropriate advice and support. Jackie Bailey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. You will be aware, of course, that the cost of repairs to the boiler on the Waverley could be as much as £2 million. Given that we all want to see the iconic Waverley sailing again next year, will the Cabinet Secretary also consider providing financial assistance to help them? And will she agree to meet with me and representatives of the Waverley to discuss this further? Fiona Hislop. Uh, well, clearly, uh, the Waverley's uh, current situation is of serious concern. We understand it was about uh, repairing uh, boilerworks originally, but I understand from their own statements that they require full replacement, which is why there's the extent of the costs. Um, I'm more than happy to arrange um, appropriate meetings, but perhaps we have to identify the appropriate bodies um, who could support the Waverley in any applications. As I said, there's been no uh, contact made to date, but as someone who celebrated our 21st birthday sailing on the Clyde from air to largs, I certainly have a great fondness for the Waverley, as I think uh, the rest of Scotland do, and I think everybody wishes they saved the Waverley campaign well, and uh, if the public can get behind uh, the, the scheme as well and donate and then I'm sure we can see the Waverley sailing again. Supplementary Jamie Green. 
Thanks, Mr. Ringo. Sir, it's heartbreaking that the Waverley won't be sailing uh, the Clyde this year, and at least past my office in Largs, as I see it so regularly. Um, but can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she think that organisations such as Historic Environment Scotland, which play such a vital role in preserving buildings, castles and settlements, might have a role to play to also help preserving our sea vessels? Fiona Hislop. I think the member makes an important point. Uh, maritime uh, vessels are very expensive to support, as we've just heard, but they're also a very much important part of our heritage. For example, the Scottish Government has helped uh, the Maritime Museum um, and in the support of the Reaper, for example, but that's because it is associated with that, uh, um, with that museum in particular. I think there are challenges. I know that Historic Environment Scotland have responsibility for marine heritage in relation to some of the maritime planning zones, but it is a challenge in terms of what can be given in terms of grant. But I'm happy to investigate further what is possible, but I, I suspect he's hinting at something where we have to uh, recognise that there, there are real, there's a real demand there. I'm not sure we can meet all the demands there are and the frequent letters I receive in relation to, to maritime heritage, but I'm uh, happy to take that matter further. Apologies to Gordon MacDonald for being unable to reach his question and we'll move on to the next portfolio. Uh, we now move on to the education and skills portfolio. Question number one, Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase access to funding for apprenticeships in the construction sector. Jamie Hepburn. We are delivering more apprenticeships in Scotland than ever before during 2017-18. The Scottish Government supported 6,104 people into modern apprenticeships in the construction sector. Construction tends to be the largest sector with 22.5% of all modern apprenticeship starts being in this sector. Work is already underway to deliver even more apprenticeships this year. We've set an ambitious target to provide 29,000 new starts in 2019-20, including up to 1,300 graduate apprenticeships. Construction is a priority sector with a 38% rise in modern apprenticeship starts in this sector over the past five years. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. At a recent Economy Committee inquiry into the construction sector, we heard the following evidence from a sector association. Funding is difficult to access. For example, in relation to the Flexible Workforce Development Fund, the college courses on offer do not meet the needs of employers. Given that evidence, how will the Minister ensure that the delivery of courses available through the apprenticeship levy can be better tailored to the needs of the construction sector? Jamie Hepburn. Well, I, I'm always uh, uh, keen to make sure that anything we offer through our uh, skills system is responsive to the needs of industry. In terms of the Flex Workforce Development Fund, my expectation is colleges should be responding to individual uh, employer demand. If there's a specific employer that's felt that's not been the case, I will always be willing to hear that. But in relation to uh, apprenticeships, I'm inclined to be uh, led by the evidence which it shows, as I've said, a 38% increase in the number of construction modern apprentices over the last five years, a year-on-year -year increase. So we've gone from 4,435 in 2013-14, a year-on-year -year increase, to 2017-18, the last year we have full figures for, to 6,104, which suggests to me that the sector is well able to access the funding on offer. Question number two, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure our primary school system is fit for purpose. John Swinney. So, sir, our national improvement framework for education contains a wide range of actions to ensure that children leave primary school with the knowledge, skills, attributes and capabilities necessary for their next phase of learning. This includes our investment in leadership and professional learning for primary teachers, robust arrangements for inspection and improvement, support for regional improvement collaboratives, investment in the primary school estate and our continued support for Scottish national standardised assessments in the primary sector. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you for that answer. But last September, this Parliament voted 63 to 61 to halt the Scottish National Standardised Assessment for P1 pupils. As a result, an independent review of P1 testing is due to report this month. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he is committed to implementing the findings of that review and can the parents of children due to start P1 in August expect the evidence-based approach he promised in October? John Swinney. Uh, yes, I, I am committed to the implementation of the conclusions of the review, as Michelle Ballantyne will be aware. Um, we said that we would listen carefully, first of all, to the P1 Practitioner Forum that I established, and they set out a number of recommendations which we are now taking forward for implementation. 
um, I expect to receive the report um, from the um, independent assessment of P1 assessments from uh, David Reedy very shortly. And obviously, uh, the government will reflect carefully on the evidence that that demonstrates. As I've maintained throughout this whole uh, discussion that Parliament has been involved in, I'm interested in the evidence on this question, and I certainly will follow the evidence. Supplementary, Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, figures released by the government last week in response to a Freedom of Information request uh, show that almost 80% of SNSA tests sat by primary one pupils were conducted in a single month, March. These figures surely make a mockery of the Cabinet Secretary's claim that these tests are diagnostic and should be taken when the teacher believes it is right for the child. Do they not? John Swinney. Uh, no, because I don't think the uh, assessment period that Mr Gray refers to will be the only assessment period in which these are carried out. Um, he cites the information about a limited time period. I would expect there to be further assessments carried out uh, throughout the month of April and into May and into June. So the, uh, what we will be uh, making a judgment about is about the effectiveness of the standardised assessments in making an impact on teacher judgment uh, to, to enable teachers to undertake the diagnostic assessment that I believe is essential in all of these, um, uh, in all of this analysis to make sure that we're supporting young people in enhancing and developing their learning. Question number three, Kezia Tugdale. Asked the Scottish Government what its response is to the recently re released NASWAT survey on teachers' mental health. John Swinney. So no teacher should feel that their job adversely affects their mental health, well-being, both mental and physical, affects us all and should be rightly taken seriously. These survey findings are therefore extremely worrying. Local authorities as employers have a duty of care for all of their staff, including teachers. The Scottish Government, along with local authorities, is already taking action to address conditions which affect well-being by putting in place additional support for teachers to tackle workload issues and improve recruitment and retention rates. And the recent pay deal provides certainty in pay and sets a, standard, a shared agenda on addressing workload, additional support for learning and empowering schools for the next two years, which I hope contributes to strengthening the working environment for teachers. Kezia Dugdale. Now, sir, the survey is full of grim statistics for the government, so I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for acknowledging that it is worrying, because it does say that 54% of teachers say job satisfaction is in decline, 55% have considered leaving the profession altogether. So how will John Swinney ensure teachers stay on, and what's he going to do if they leave? John Swinney. Well, well, the first thing I've done is, is, is recognised the importance and the significance of issues about the mental health and well-being of members of staff. And uh, I want to work with the professional associations. It was the foundation of the um, pay and workload deal that we've just agreed. I want to work with the professional associations to make sure that we enhance the working environment for teachers to enable them to concentrate on what has and motivated them to enter the teaching profession in the first place, which is to, is to, is to share and to lead learning and teaching. Um, part of that effort must involve tackling unnecessary tasks and work that teachers are involved in. And I have made it very clear in the pay and workload deal that I look to work closely with teachers and the professional associations to identify by creating a sense of teacher agency and teacher autonomy the capacity within the teaching profession to make choices about how they spend their time so that they can spend their time on the productive and valuable aspects of learning and teaching and not on the unproductive and unnecessary tasks of bureaucracy. Now, I can't mandate that from St Andrew's House. I need to engage the profession to enable the profession to uh, deliver that. And that's exactly what I'm concentrating on doing. Question number four, Angela Constance. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting youth employment in the Amund Valley constituency. Jamie Hepburn. We've seen good progress in supporting youth employment through the delivery of developing young workforce in Almond Valley. Collaboration between West Lothian College and the area's 11 secondary schools ensures career education central to the curriculum offer as a result of joint planning exercises for each academic year. A forum comprised of schools and the college creates a strong focus on the work readiness and training aspects of education. In addition, the Developing Young Workforce Regional Group has been working in partnership with schools, colleges, local authorities and employers in the area to develop innovative approaches to education. In West Codder, for example, employers have supported the school to develop a six-week employment-ready programme for S4 pupils who face additional barriers to employment. Angela Constance. I thank the Minister for his answer and will he 
join me in congratulating Mitsubishi Electric Air Conditioning Systems and the West Lothian Chamber of Commerce, who for the fifth year running will host the finals of the Pump It Up Schools Challenge, a fantastic example of partnership between industry and schools, helping young people develop a very wide range of skills. And would he meet with West Lothian DYW Group to discuss what more can be done to connect the world of education uh, with the world of work in West Lothian and beyond? Jamie Hepburn. Well, let me first of all uh, join with uh, Angela Constance in commending the activity that's taking place between Mitsubishi and young people in the West Lothian area. I'm always very delighted. For, I think it's very important for me to uh, engage and interact with the developing young force regional groups across the country. So on that basis, yes, I'd be very happy to go and meet the DYW regional group uh, in West Lothian, who I already uh, know are undertaking a, a range of activities uh, in the area. And yes, I'd be very delighted to, to go meet them along with Ms Constance, to learn more about what they're doing and what more we can do together. Question number five, Annie Wells. To ask the Scottish Government whether the number of pupils with addi additional support needs to have a coordinated support plan in place is increasing. John Swinney. President Officer, education authorities use a range of planning mechanisms to meet the needs of children and young people. Coordinated support plans are used where children have complex or multiple needs which require significant support from education and other agencies. In 2018, there were 199,065 children and young people who were recorded as having additional support needs. Of this, 1,986 pupils were recorded as having a CSP. This represents 1% of the total number of children recorded as having an additional support need, a small decrease from the previous year when the total stood at 2,182. Annie Wells. Thank you for that answer. Um, we are seeing record highs in the number of pupils in Scottish schools who have additional support needs. So it seems obvious that we should have seen a huge increase in the number who have coordinated support plans in place. But that hasn't happened. Unbelievably, the numbers are actually falling. The onus shouldn't just be on local authorities. So can the Cabinet Secretary say that what his SNP government is doing enough is, is doing enough to ensure councils can help every young person who needs a plan have one in place? John Swinney. Well, the, fir the first point, President Officer, is I don't think that it follows that because there has been an increase in the number of young people and children who are de defined as having additional support needs, that that should have related to an increase in those having coordinated support plans. Um, as Annie Wells will know, uh, there has been a very significant broadening of the definition of, of additional support needs. Um, and that reflects the fact that a much wider cohort of young people are affected. And my original answer made clear that uh, a whole range of different supports are put in place to meet the needs of children and young people. The judgment about coordinated support plans is where a young person requires uh, complex or multiple support from a range of different agencies. And that's the, the key test. Now, Annie Wells said that this should not be a matter for local authorities. That is what the law says. That is what statute that this parliament has passed says, that it's a matter for local authorities to determine the uh, appropriateness of designating uh, an, indiv a young, an individual child or young person requiring a, a coordinated support plan. And of course, if a family disagrees with a judgment made by a local authority, they have real recourse to a tribunal to challenge the judgment of the local authority in that respect. Now, what I can say to uh, Annie Wells is, as I made clear in the debate last week, the government will review the implementation and application of coordinated support plans to ensure that the statutory force that Parliament expected to be applied in this respect is being applied. And obviously, I'll report to Parliament on that point in due course. Question number six, Bill Bowman. To the Scottish Government, how many people achieve vocational qualifications at stage four as part of the Skills Development Scotland Employability Fund for 2018-19? Jamie Hepburn. Skills Development Scotland will publish full year statistics for the Employability Fund in 2018-19 next month. Bill Bowman. I thank the Minister for that response. The Employability Fund has a strong focus on work experience, but in its report, there was no stage four fund recipients for Dundee City in the first three quarters of 1819. And this is because most of its fund recipients are aged 16 to 24 and lack the work experience to get stage four reskilling. What is the minister doing to help Dundee people now stuck in this bottleneck to employment and to address a potential skills drought? Jamie Hepburn. 
Yeah, well, of course, what we uh, seek to do is work with a, a range of organisations in, in any area to respond to specific demand. Now, if there is a particular uh, area of, um, of bottleneck, as the member puts it in Dundee, then it's incumbent on us to, to look at that. So, uh, having heard what Mr Bowman has said, I'll uh, gladly take it away and consider what more we may need to do uh, in Dundee. But, of course, we uh, continue to fund the Employability Fund uh, this year, as we have done Last year, it supports many thousands of uh, people across the country, including uh, in Dundee, uh, and that will continue to be the case this year. But I will take on board the issue he's raised and uh, come back to him. Question number seven has been withdrawn. So question number eight, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how they are supporting Scotland's colleges. Richard Lockhead. Since 2007, we've invested more than £7 billion into Scotland's colleges. And now set against a £2 billion real terms cut to a resource block grant over the last decade by the UK government, we've still managed to increase our investment in colleges in real terms to over £600 million in the 2019-2020 budget. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Um, in terms of supporting colleges, ministers intervened to resolve the college dispute over pay harmonisation and to ensure national pay skills were introduced. But now, College of Scotland's failure to provide a fair cost of living increase threatens to unravel that very agreement, even as it is being implemented. So, why will ministers not intervene now to ensure lecturers are made a fair pay offer in the interests of staff and students? Richard Lockhead. Well, I'm sure, like most members, um, I very much regret the current dispute that's ongoing and the fact that there was strike action just last week. Uh, as the member will be aware, national bargaining was hard won and is a joint voluntary arrangement between the employers and the trade unions. Therefore, I hope she'll accept that. Therefore, it's the responsibility of the employers and the trade unions to resolve this dispute. I am meeting both sides next week and I will reiterate as hard as I can the absolute urgency in getting an agreement over the line because it's very disappointing that we're so close to have an agreement just in the last days before the recent strike action uh, that you surely now we can get it over the line and I will be putting as much uh, argument behind that case as possible when I meet them next week. I understand Rachel Hamilton has something she would like to say. I'd like to declare an interest um, uh, draw members to my register of interest on the supplementary that I made in the culture and tourism questions to question five. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hamilton. That concludes portfolio questions and we'll move on to the next item of business.